and um, uh, George, I think, saw it and asked me to give this. So I, I'm pleased to have that opportunity to give that to you, particularly since um, the two clubs have had an association for many, many years. And in recent times, because of Zoom, we've been able to have a much greater interaction than we've ever had in the past. Um, so I'm going to start off um, with giving a few um, images, and I've got to work out how to do this um, successfully. Let me just see if this works. No, the screen's gone blank, hasn't it? Whoops. And I'm just going to run through a few images. This is a Channel Bill Cuckoo. Um, they, uh, I was near a, um, a raven's nest and there was a great lot of noise and everything. And um, what it was is that these go and take, raid the eggs from the nest and then they would go and lay their own eggs in the uh, uh, host bird's nest and the young get raised by the, uh, the host. A moment later, that egg disappeared down its throat. Rainbow bee eaters, um, lovely birds. I presume you would have something similar over that way. I'm not sure. I know they are in South Africa. Sea eagles. A whistling kite and the sea eagle, when it goes and uh, defends itself against uh, the sea eagle, will turn upside down. This is a juvenile sea eagle because of the brown here. Um, the other sea eagles are very black wings and white um, chest, such like this and this one. This, uh, we were out photographing the sea eagles and this, we spotted this, and this is, I guess, a catfish. Um, and moments later, it swallowed the whole thing. Uh, this one has gained me a, a uh, uh, an award in the local, in the Maitland International uh, recently. These are gangangs. These are cockatoos. This is a male with the red head. This is the, um, a juvenile where the red. It's a male where the red is coming up like this. The female looks like this, except it doesn't have the red. Um, an osprey, red-browed finches, another osprey, a glossy-backed ibis, um, yellow-faced honey eaters. I'm throwing in a couple of odd ones. And this is a regent honey eater. This is a, uh, a very endangered bird. And we're talking in terms of sometimes only hundreds of them in Australia. Um, and when these appear, people come from everywhere to go and photograph them. Um, and we seem to be fortunate that maybe the numbers are increasing a little, but um, we uh, will have to see how we go. Right. So I wanted to give you a bit of an idea of where all of this is occurring. Um, so Here's Sydney, the city centre. This is Castle Hill here. This is where I actually live. And the RSL club is three minutes from where I live. Some of the images I'll show you are around this area here. The sea eagles are here. Um, egrets that I'll show you later on are up here. This is about an hour and 40 minute drive. Um, we've got other things I'll show you out here from Lake Wallace near Wallerawang. Uh, that's about a two hour drive. You'll find that in Australia, people will often refer, particularly out in the country areas, the rural areas, um, they don't give you a distance to between places, they'll give you a time. And in the real outback, if you're out there and you ask where something is, some place is, you might get told it's just down the road and just down the road could be 500 miles away. Um, it's a big country. 
Um, if you look at the roads that are here, you might think that there's a lot of um, roads that are probably not being shown on this map through places like this. There aren't any. This is the Blue Mountains through here. Uh, they're not very high, but they're very, very rugged with sheer walls um, going down into canyons. And um, you may have heard of the Wollombi pines, or sometimes referred to as the dinosaur pines, because they were, these were discovered uh, in this area here, um, and they've been hidden to people for many, you know, hundreds of years. And uh, these harken back to the time of the dinosaurs, and they were an amazing discovery but it's so remote that a lot of people hadn't ever come across them. So this is the type of country that's through here. Um, so just to get, um, and you saw the white water. And some people have said to me when I go and show that, why are you showing sports things in a birding presentation? And the point is the same technique for birding is exactly the same technique for doing sports. So, um that's uh that's why i show that and we have at castle hill some special interest groups um and one of them is nature sports action and people said to me why sports action with nature and that was the reason also up in this area uh we've got in this area here is wine um We've got a little bit further north is Rodeo's barrel racing and ranch sorting, which was one of those images that I showed you towards the end there. So what we're gonna do is a little bit about my background, some birding techniques, what makes a competition image and some processing if there's time. And I know that you um, go for about two hours. I have built in a break uh, along the way. So where did I start? Well, I'm still really a bit of a novice at uh, all of this because I started in 2013 uh, with the D7100. Um, I had no specific photographic passion, but I gravitated towards birding because of some wonderful members that we have in our club. And I started with bush birds and learning to identify them, getting the bird portraits are interesting, but you need a stronger story. So with outings with more experience, the uh, birders I got a bit uh, better. And then I started to upgrade my equipment and then later on joined the Entrance Camera Club in 2017. And the Entrance Camera Club has got some amazing nature photographers and that has helped my um, me as well. So I started to get recognized as a bird photographer by my peers. And then I started to go into external competitions and getting acceptances and awards in international exhibitions. So where did it start? Well, this was back in 2013 at Mount Wilson, which is near where I showed you where those Wollombi pines are. And we were out walking and I looked over a ledge and I saw this bird and I just took this very terrible photograph of an Eastern Spinebill and I've kept it because this was the image that actually started me on this journey. Um, and it took me a time to identify it. And that's the fun of sometimes with birding is to see a new bird, identify it and so forth. So it's, uh, it, this is where I started. And you can see it was pretty terrible. And then I started to uh, go to a local area up on the central coast called Summersby Falls. But near the car park, I discovered that there were all these birds, uh, an Eastern yellow robin. Um, a lyrebird. Now, a lyrebird is an amazing bird. It is. Uh, it does mimics a lot of things. It'll mimic other birds. It will mimic um, human sounds. It. Um, there are areas uh, in Victoria where you can still hear the click and wind on of film cameras. They will mimic a chainsaw a car alarm, a, an electric drill, uh, you name it, they will mimic it. And um, I would urge you to go and look up some YouTube uh, videos that will give you some of the sounds that they make. 
And you might think that when you're looking at the video that that's been dubbed. No, it hasn't. They make those sorts of sounds. Amazing bird. They're called a lyre bird because this tail with the male, actually when he displays it, looks like a, the old fashioned lyre uh, instrument. And then I discovered that nearby, um, within a kilometer of where I'm sitting at the moment, there's all these birds in a reserve that's uh, just virtually across the road from me. And um, so I started again, it increased my interest in birding. And as you can see, the images are still not great. I improved my, um, my equipment and I improved my technique. And this is a whip bird. A whip bird is uh, one of my favorite birds. They love to hide in these um, bushy areas and they often don't come out and display themselves like this. Um, but they're called a whip bird because they make the sound of a whip. And then it follows with two little dit dit sounds. And this is unique. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that that initial whip that you hear is the male, the dit dit that follows is the female. So they do it in unison. And then maybe it's because the male is saying, I'm here, and the female is saying, I'm over here. Um, and then I started to get um, a little bit better mistletoe bird, the um, rainbow bee eater. Um, they catch these insects and quite often they'll just uh, sit there and after a while they might start tossing them up and catching them, tossing them up and catching them. And this was one of the ones that I started to get some uh, recognition for. Uh, azure kingfishers that you have over there, I see quite a bit from some of the images. And this is an osprey with a tag on it. And the reason I put this in is that we had been out with the entrance camera club um, this particular one was uh, photographed and people had the first, uh, the first five digits around this side. Uh, they didn't have the last three, so they couldn't identify it. I'd been there with them, taking some photos. It was conversation, came up in conversation again. And I idly looked at what I was taking and I saw the last four digits, three digits, and that enabled this to be identified. It had been, um, born up in the Port Macquarie area where it was tagged. It had come down a few hundred kilometers down south to the entrance, uh, raised its family there. So people were very keen to know about it because normally when they get information about from a tag, the bird's dead. So this was information about a live bird. So the people who keep those records were very keen and excited about that. Then I started to get some awards um, with the rainbow beaters, um, the sacred kingfisher coming into its nest. Um, the Eurasian coot with its young. This got me a gold medal in Corsica. Um, an osprey, um, that got me an award. And then starting to um, get other images. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a yellow-tailed black cockatoo um, that we see quite a bit around our area. Um, the osprey building its nest in, uh, on a sports ground. That nest is now way up here. Um, but I throw this in because one of the items that um, uh, is in nature competitions is um, that you can't have evidence of man. But then this is where the bird has decided to, uh, to build its nest. So it just happens to be, you know, some man-made elements and people, and the specification says that some of the exceptions are barn owls and storks because that's, they use human uh, elements as part of their life. Now you'll be getting a talk from Roy Killen in a couple of weeks time. And Roy is an exceptional nature bird photographer, nature photographer, and very much involved in those uh, nature specifications by the PSA and FIAP. And he's starting to recognize that something like this is where the birds decided to, to do this. And it just happens to be having elements of man. This is a magpie. I've seen your magpies. It's a little bit different to ours, but these were obviously named after yours when the, um, the colonies, colony was first um, discovered and, and uh, populated by, um, by British. Um, 
these birds, uh, this uh, has a bird song that is absolutely amazingly beautiful. When they get together and they do what's called caroling, it is uh, an amazing sound. And scientists have um, researched this and Australian birds have been um, designated as being the founders of bird song. And um, we've got some amazing uh, sounding birds. And this is probably the best bird song in the world uh, when they carol. Getting a little closer to time, um, a royal spoonbill um, that we get up at the Hunter Wetlands, which we'll be showing. You've seen this one before and the gang gangs. And then more recently, I got um, the mirrorless uh, Nikon C50. And this is a butcher bird. And this actually is my backyard. And the lorikeets are something that uh, visit um, our backyard quite a lot. Um, I actually have eat a lot of apples and I throw out the apple cores and they come down. And sometimes when um, we're having breakfast and uh, a lorikeet might come up to our back door, look in and say, it's uh, morning tea time, fellas. You haven't put the apple cores out. Um, and then a little more recently, we have uh, the egrets nesting up at uh, the Hunter Wetlands. And I ended up with the C7 II and I found this an amazing uh, camera. And um, Eurasian coots, and I think you've got something probably fairly similar. And the great crested grebe, which is a bird that I've only seen recently and one that I've always wanted to see. Um, and uh, one of those things that once you see a bird once, amazingly after that, you seem to see a lot of them. And I know from something that I've seen that you have these over your way. Um, so what I'm gonna cover now is um, a little bit on the definition of nature, some approaches to shooting, some different camera techniques, um, show you some more images where I put these techniques into practice, have a break, and then we'll follow on with this afterwards. And if we have time, we'll do a, um, a demo. Um, so the basically one of the important things about the nature of definition is that there's no evidence of man, no cloning out, no additions. You can crop, uh, you can have light adjustments, you can remove dust scratches and spots, you can sharpen, but it must look natural. And I put these two images in because you could be prompt wanting to take out these things, but you can't. And this one, it's not natural because I deliberately put um, the color of the, these are uh, Bahinia's flowers. It's actually comes from Hong Kong, which again is not permitted in Australia because it's not native to Australia, but it's also not natural looking. Uh, Roy has got a very good explanation of the definition and also very much involved, as I said, with the PSA and FIAP. He's working with the FIAP at the moment to bring standardization across the different uh, definitions because the PSA added a couple of um, paragraphs which says that you cannot bait with live animals, um, that you cannot remove birds from nests and you can't have drones. But that's not in FIAP at the moment and he works, he's working with them on that. Now, how are we going for time? Okay. Um, there's four different approaches to shooting. Um, traditionally, um, I think people started off with aperture priority. And I think this came out of the film days because you would go and set your film, uh, put your film in, you'd go out and aperture was the, the um, parameter that you uh, could use. You have to, in birding, you have to have something that the camera does because in pure manual, it is very difficult to keep adjusting everything and you don't have time. You have to give the camera one parameter to um, be able to take care of. And the obvious one is aperture. So um, here the ISO and the aperture is set and the shutter speed floats. 
but it means that you've got to set an ISO high enough to achieve the, a fast enough shutter speed. Um, so essentially the ISO is higher than what is needed generally. Um, and the shutter speed then may not be high enough if you don't set the ISO high enough. So there's some of the, the issues that can arise from that. Now with the advent of DSLRs and the fact that you can now have manual with auto ISO, a lot of people are moving in that direction. So this gives you the advantage where you set the shutter speed and the aperture and the ISO floats. So you've got more control over the shutter speed for suddenly changing action because you can just go and from a slower shutter speed to a higher shutter speed with just a flick of the control wheel. Um, the ISO will be the lowest needed for the shot, but it can hit the base ISO, which can happen more in Australia with so much sunlight that we have. So you can get underexposed, um, but it will change with the light conditions. So it can drop from uh, the higher ISO when you've got a shady area and to when your bird moves into sunlight. So it will actually give you a lower, the lowest ISO for the circumstances. Another one that I'm starting to see a little bit of is the using aperture priority with auto ISO, which I call the hybrid. Um, but you need to set the shutter, um, a lower limit on your shutter speed so that you don't go too low. Um, so you've now got the situation where the camera manipulates two parameters. So which takes priority? Well, shutter speed will take priority. And if it comes down to your lower limit, then the ISO will increase. Um, another, the last one is the um, shutter priority. And I've only come across one person um, who has advocated this and they were um, doing tours to Africa and been doing so for decades. And perhaps there you've got a lot of light, your animals are far enough away and so it might make a lot of sense where you um, set your ISO and your shutter speed and your aperture floats. And because they're far enough away, your depth of field is going to be enough to encompass your subject. Um, and that may work there, um, but it's not one um, approach that uh, is used a lot. Now, do you use <clears throat> matrix or evaluative or spot metering? I tend to use spot metering because I find that you're going to get the exposure for your subject that you're focused on. And if it's backlit, it's in shade or it's in foliage and so forth, then you'll get a better um, exposure um, because otherwise you might find your subject gets silhouetted. Um, it's up to people. I know people who will use um, matrix or evaluative in preference, but that's my preference. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few things that everybody is very uh, knows because we know about the exposure tr um, triangle, we know um, about uh, white balance and so forth, but I like to look at things and I'm one of those people who probably like to drive the, the dreaded word of every parent that every child has, why? And I go and investigate things. And I like to understand my camera. I see it as a tool. I want to know exactly what it is doing when I'm taking a shot. And I'm making the distinction between exposure and the exposure triangle. Because exposure is basically what is the light that is out there. And you've only got two parameters for capturing that light, shutter speed and the aperture. And you can vary those two parameters depending on the artistic outcome you want. Do you want to freeze the action? Do you want to have um, a bit of movement in there to, um, because that might be the outcome that you're looking for? Do you want to have everything in focus? Do you want to have the background blurred? That's the kind of decisions you make. And they're the, that, that's what you do here. ISO is something that happens um, is not associated with that exposure. What ISO is, is what happens uh, when the available light is captured and it amplifies the available light. 
it basically, if you think back in the film days, you had to choose your ISO before you went out. So it had nothing to do with the available light when you went and clicked the shutter. It is a feedback mechanism that enables you to make different decisions. So the difference is the exposure is what the camera sees before you click. ISO is what the camera processor does after you click and is the feedback mechanism to give you different choices. The distinction is subtle, but to me it's important. And I just throw it in there if it makes uh, you to look at ISO in a slightly different way. Um, so saying, why is it important? In the film days, you chose it before you went out so that the expected metered exposure will give you the result. With the DSLR, the auto ISO is adjusted, adjusting the metered exposure on the fly, which we can then check after taking the shot. With mirrorless, the auto ISO is allowing a preview of the actual metered exposure to display in the uh, viewfinder in real time, but it's still only, uh, ISO only kicks in after you go click and the light that's captured is then amplified according to that ISO reading. So then I move on to exposure compensation. Um, and what I've got reminded of more recently when I went out to do um, photographing seagulls is um, that we had to go and um, we were advised to use an exposure compensation of minus two. And I thought, my God, I've never gone down that low. So I started to investigate it and got reminded when I was investigating this, that what cameras metered to is 18% gray. And that means if most of the frame is light as against a bird in the sky, then it will want to underexpose to bring it back to 18% gray. So you need to have a plus exposure compensation. If most of the frame is dark, then it will want to lighten the image. So you need to have a minus exposure compensation. And, the, and this comes in with the sea eagles because although the sea eagle is largely dark, it might be dark against the, uh, the trees in the background, but they've got a white breast. If you don't go to minus two or somewhere between minus one and minus two, depending on circumstances, then that white breast will blow out and you won't have the detail and you won't have an acceptable image. So what it comes down to is, is that the exposure compensation is your override to the uh, metering that your camera will do. And um, so I've ended up becoming to change my exposure compensation frequently. And so uh, what it's basically doing is that if your um, shutter speed is, if you're in aperture, it will vary your shutter speed. If you're in uh, using manual and auto ISO, it will lower or raise your ISO. So it's actually acting as an override for the parameter that you're using that's allowed to vary. And this is what is the example where, although the background is very dark, you need to go to a minus, um, a very high minus exposure compensation so that you get that white um, not blowing out. So an easy way to remember this is that if it is light, make it lighter as against the whistling kite against the sky. Um, I always had had problems with whistling kites until um, somebody had said to me, make it lighter. And, um, and then it came out a little better. If it is dark, make it darker. And that meant that all of this white didn't blow out because of the negative exposure compensation. And just to give an example of this, uh, this was using in my backyard, I deliberately exposed this bohinia flower. Um, if you look at this, this is 18% gray. Um, it's plus 2.33. Um, this is just a straight raw file that I just put through 
um, and did it and made a JPEG uh, so I could display no changes. So that was correctly exposed. This is the same image with a little bit of enhancement. So, you know, the exposure hadn't changed there. Now, um, this is a shot that I took. Uh, these are some of the settings that I had. It was actually minus uh, 1.33 um, exposure compensation. And the other item that I do is that I always have my white balance as sunny. And the reasoning is that um, I end up with a constant color temperature that you're setting. So what is color temperature and white balance? Well, color temperature is, we know what color is, all the colors of the rainbow. The temperature is measured in degrees Kelvin. The lower the temperature are the yellows um, and the higher the temperature are the blues. And the thing is that color and temperature is affected by sun and shade. So when you've got a scene in front of you, the available light, you've got all sorts of color temperatures out there. And what do you do when you, if you put use auto balance, white balance is the camera is going to take its best guess of the average color temperature out there. So you're letting your camera make that decision for you. And um, a very good um, photographer said one time, he only uses sunny. And I use sunny whether I'm in shade, indoors, outdoors, and I have one color temperature that when I go and process my images that I know where my base temperature is. So what the difference is, is that color temperature is the available light that the camera sees before you go click. White balance is what the camera processor does after you go click. And it does that to offset any color cast. And there's always a color cast in any image and you the camera is either going to do that. It will add yellow to offset the blues. It will add blue to offset the yellows. And um, it will do a pretty good job. But um, it, uh, I find it suitable for me to use a uh, sunny. But also, you do it, uh, make adjustments in your post processing. Um, and a lot of people just leave the, um, that alone but there are reasons that you could uh, make the adjustment. So um, we have a lot of sunshine out here. This might work beautifully for us out here. It may not in your world, but I just raised that. So I'm going to show some images now. Um, I'm just trying to look at the time and um, to give you an idea of some of the um, images that I'm getting from the um, uh, these settings. And so this is my backyard and these are uh, magpies. So this is an adult magpie here. And this is a young uh, magpie with the, the lighter gray sort of colors. Um, and this is jacaranda tree, um, which is a South American tree, but is now very prolific in Australia because it got imported as happens. And um, they may, has these beautiful uh, purpley blue flowers in uh, when, it, when it blooms. This is that uh, butcher bird. Um, my wife used to uh, throw out some um, strips of uh, beef that <laughs> we bought specifically for the purpose. She could throw it up in the air and this was like a flyby. It would zoom in and catch it midair and go off and, um, and eat it. It's called a butcher bird. And I know you've got um, one in the UK that has a nickname butcher bird for the, probably the same reason. Uh, I think it's a black, a red backed shrike. Uh, but this is actually a butcher bird uh, by, his, that's his actual name. And we discovered one, and I read up about it, and I discovered um, why they're called a butcher bird. And it caught the meat, went over to the fence, wedged it into a crack, and then proceeded to butcher the meat. 
And that's what they do. They catch their prey, skewer it on a stick, and then butcher it. We get kookaburras. Um, and if you've not seen what a kookaburra does, if it catches a snake, a lizard, whatever, it will go somewhere and it will bash it to kill it. Um, and um, I've had um, been somewhere, um, I've had a sausage on the plate, the kookaburra had been eyeing things away, down it came before you knew it, off went the sausage, um, kookaburra up in the tree, and then it proceeded to kill the sausage by bashing it against the branch. And a little confrontation between the magpie and the kookaburra. Um, this is the one that you've seen before. Um, these lorikeets are very prolific out here. Um, there are areas in Castle Hill and in other places as well um, where there are trees in the streets um, of a night time, you can go up there and it's almost deafening with the hundreds upon hundreds of lorikeets going and uh, starting to roost for the night and all chatting to each other. Um, and that, so these are very common bird to see around the place. And uh, this is a noisy miner. It is a honey eater. Uh, honey eaters are one of the largest um, groups in um, our birds. And it um, is a pest actually. These have become very aggressive and uh, they will, ch I've seen them chase uh, raptors and so forth. Um, yeah, and they're now starting to teach other birds to be aggressive as well. So I've seen um, uh, magpies um, and other smaller birds um, chasing raptors um, through that learnt um, behaviour. So this is my backyard and that blackness there is my garage. And again, they're so cute. We have these flowering gums and they get, uh, the lorikeets get attracted to them. And um, yeah, so just some of the fun things that we can have in the backyard. These are frogmouth. Uh, these are not owls. Everybody, a lot of people think they are because of the way that they look, but they're not of the owl family. And this is in our front yard. And again, another kookaburra and the magpies. This is a common bronze wing. It's a pigeon. Um, this color in the wings, if you get the sunlight on it, will just shine and it's really brilliant. Um, and these are a fairly common visitor to our backyard. And a galah. Uh, this was um, sitting on the aerial of my neighbor's roof and I just captured in flight. Um, these are very common around the place. Um, this beautiful red. Australians have an expression where they'll say, call somebody a bit of a galah, and meaning that they're a bit of an idiot, that they're, you know, they're doing something a bit, or a goose, I guess, as my wife just said, might be the term you guys might use, but we use the term galah. Um, now, The seagulls, um, as you saw on that map, that's only about 40 minutes away um, where we go out um, on the Hawkesbury River to uh, go and photograph these. Um, I go on a bit of an organized uh, trip um, for photographers in a boat. Um, I'm going out on March the 8th again to do this because it's a great opportunity to do this and um, we just spend, yeah, get some amazing uh, images while we're out um, and about. And this is a whistling kite and this is the seagull. This is very early in the morning, which is why you get that strange looking look to them. And um, we've been, there's a particular area where both of these birds reside and we've had a time where for half an hour, these, this kind of battle is going on with a 
whole groups of these uh, whistling kites and sea eagles. And it's a case of which one of these will I try and photograph? And, and you're just looking straight up in the air, photographing left and right. And, and that it can be quite an amazing uh, experience. This one got so close to me <laughs> that it filled the frame. So what happens when you don't have all the wings and body in? You crop in a little closer and you get this uh, bird portrait. And I was just amazed at the amount of detail that was in the bird um, with this. I've put this into exhibitions, but it doesn't do well, I guess, because um, that's not a strong enough story, but I liked it. And I guess that at times is the important thing. So um, we do get the opportunity to get images where they're uh, coming down and getting the, uh, the fish. Um, we do bring along the fish. Um, and the important statement in the nature definition is live. You can't bait with live animals. And I raised this with Roy Killen. And what he did was he came back to me with an example of what he said, what they don't want to see. And the example was some Bengal tigers that were there. Um, one of them was up with the paws, almost around a guinea fowl. Now, guinea fowls, and I, I might have been in snow as well. So guinea fowls, Bengal tigers and snow don't mix. So that's what they're saying they don't want to see. Um, and actually, Roy was on one of these uh, trips with me as well. Um, so what will happen is that the sea eagle will um, be seen roosting somewhere, and we might go a kilometre or so down river um, because these have got amazing eyesight and gives then an opportunity for us to see them approaching and to start to focus on them. And what they will do is they'll circle around a bit and then you'll see them dip their wing like this. And that's with them starting to come down to do their run to, uh, to get the, the fish. Um, this is a wedgetail eagle. This is the largest raptor in Australia. That wingspan could be something like seven foot wide. Um, if they're roosting, um, they're probably four foot high. Yeah, these are big birds. This was very high up in the sky. Uh, this is a very, very heavy crop. Um, a peregrine falcon that we see um, as well in these uh, trips. And the peregrine falcon um, is so fast that when it dies, it can uh, hit the head and neck of the seagull and break it. Um, apparently. So, um, yeah, these were an amazing sight to see. And again, some different um, views of the um, battles between the seagulls and the whistling kites. And so, yeah, we get quite a lot of opportunities to get some shots like this. So we're now going to move to the Hunter Wetlands. And the Hunter Wetlands um, is an area where a number of different types of egrets come to nest. And they all nest in this one area of the wetlands. And this is a cattle egret. And this is uh, probably taken about six or eight weeks ago, um, sitting on the nest. Um, before the, we had the, uh, the, the fledglings. Uh, these are great egrets. And quite often, you know, these, you get these images where they're coming together. And this would perhaps be a young, I'm not sure. Um, sometimes this could have been recently. And when they get big, they're big. Um, the breeding plumage. And the green here is part of the breeding uh, colors that they have. A cattle egret parent coming in and the three fledglings, not so little anymore, um, wanting to uh, get fed. 
So you get a lot of these um, sites. Now, we're looking at a scene here where there are hundreds of these uh, egrets all nesting and that. So, you know, only feet away is another group of egrets and so forth, and they're just everywhere. Um, it's an amazing sight, but the, as you can see, there's a lot of branches. Uh, this is what's called a she-oak, um, and it can often get in the way. So just to get a shot where you've got a bit of a clear view can sometimes be a task in itself. As you can see, quite often things get in the way, um, but in nature, you can't do anything about it. Uh, but of course, this wouldn't be one I'd put into competition. Um, magpie geese, um, they uh, reside in one of the, uh, near the center and um, they come out and get fed at 10.30 every morning, which is great for the little kids and so forth to see them flying over to come, uh, flying back to their, um, their roost. These were some ducks, um, I think traveler ducks that just flew in. Um, these are not seen very much, um, but um, people came to come specifically to photograph these. The uh, Royal Spoonbill. Uh, we've got two types of spoonbills. Most of them have this black uh, beak and that's called the Royal. And we have another one which has got a yellow beak, strangely called a yellow beaked. Um, Spoonbill. Um, but this one just beautifully gave me a display um, with it. And uh, I've had some interesting results with that one. And of course, when you're there, whenever you're photographing nature, there's always other things to uh, photograph. And uh, mum and um, the, um, the youngsters. And in courting time, you can get all sorts of interesting action shots uh, in this instance with the Eurasian coots. And of course, um, being uh, breeding time, um, we know what's on th this one's mind. And it starts to become nesting time where the spoonbills, uh, where I was, you saw that other shot, they moved away to another area to build their nests. So this actually was taken where I took the other shot and just uh, this bird in flight. And then you get this um, action shot where they are um, um, taking you know, a bath and you've got this beautiful plumage. Um, when it becomes breeding time, you'll get this plumage. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting to watch. And this will go on for quite a lot of minutes um, you can waste thousands of shots if you want to get these. Um, some ibis, fondly called bin chickens because they are found in the urban areas and um, around a lot of the garbage bins or whatever refuse that is around in urban areas. Um, they're not a pretty bird, but they still is a nice shot of a family you know, with the young looking to get fed by a parent and so forth. Um, obviously, because they're not the prettiest of birds, they don't do well in competitions, which I think is a shame because they are a beautiful bird in their own right. And then dragonflies, trying to capture these is an, an art in itself. Um, and we found that uh, the best way is to try and wait until they were um, laying their eggs in the water and then they will lift up in unison to go to another place and then try and then get them in midair. Uh, again, more fighting going on between the moorhens and the Eurasian coots, so a territorial dispute. And of course, it's fairly widespread. Um, some of these ducks again. This one is called a hard head, um, not because the head is hard, but apparently because of taxidermy reasons that it is difficult apparently to work on the head. Um, hence, it's ended up with the name hard head. 
we get black swans. Black swans are unique to Australia. Um, you have white swans over here, there. We have black swans and the occasional white spawn, swan. And this is where it's building its nest. It was dragging up uh, the debris from lower down for its nest. And we get lots and lots of these uh, around the place. More dragonflies. Uh, this was only taken uh, the other week. Um, this is the cattle egret and we quite often see this and it looks like, I guess, that the parent perhaps regurgitates and somehow in this interaction, the young gets fed. Um, and then the separation and then I thought, is this the uh, payback from the parent? Uh, I got amused by these three images uh, together. Um, this is just a small shot of, to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the, the birds that are here. Um, they got disturbed and so they took flight and there's just hundreds upon hundreds of these um, birds. And then the last lot for the moment is um, the great crested grebe. Now, this was a bird that I'd always seen, uh, always wanted to, fo uh, to, to photograph. I had an idea where they were about two hours drive west, um, but I had never had the opportunity to see them. And I was out in a local lagoon that I go to quite often. And I saw a neck above the water and I thought, oh, that's a pied cormorant. I got hundreds of shots of pied cormorants, but you can always have another one. And I walked down and as I got closer and looking at the viewfinder, I realized it wasn't a pied cormorant. It was a great crested grebe. And so I was able to see one for the very first time. So I was very excited. And then of course they were there for a few weeks. So I saw them a lot more. And then I went out and photographed them out at Lake Wallace with the young here. Um, and I put this in, uh, this to me is, um, I'm making sure you're on track going on the, the right way, mum. And the usual thing that we see with ducks. This is a musk duck. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's uh, quite an interesting sort of, the male, and I might have one here, has this like a big black wattle, a big black bag, black bag that is under its chin, uh, very different. This is the not so little little one trying to climb on back of mum. And uh, what will happen is sometimes they make it. And after a while, when she's had enough, she says, off you go. As we can see, one does succeed, um, the others are around. And this is like a, a bad hair day um, when it displays this. This is one of those, ah, oh, cute shots. And the little one learning to uh, display as well. This is a black-faced uh, cuckoo shrike that has found a, like a moth uh, caterpillar type thing. And again, bashing it against the branch to, uh, to kill it, hence all of this debris that's up here. And this is a water rat, something that uh, is native to Australia, this particular one, uh, something I've, ever heard, I've only ever heard about and never seen. Um, so yeah, while it's not a bird, it's just one of those unusual things that we have. So, I think if I've got my timing right, it's probably time for a break. Thank you very much, Peter. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what we what we think in uh, ten minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Uh, I'm sure Peter will be around. Okay. Um, so, 
Um, now a little bit about um, shutter speeds. And this comes back to the advantage of using manual with auto ISO because you can quickly adjust your shutter speed as um, to whether or not the bird is sitting on the branch or whether or not it's suddenly going to move because you can quickly make that change. Because uh, if you use aperture priority, um, are you going to get, is the camera going to determine which is the best shutter speed that you want? Uh, because it's only going to be using the light that it's metering to determine what that shutter speed is. Whereas you have more control with the manual uh, with auto ISO. So basically with, you know, if it's not moving, you want to have a shutter speed at least as high as your focal length. Um, but then you want to check for softness and adjust um, and maybe use a tripod um, it, or you flash if that um, uh, warrants it. But if it's moving, you want to have a higher shutter speed um, and, um, you know, to give you that um, freezing that uh, action. And this is the advantage of uh, manual with auto ISO because you can quickly make that change. So this is a yellow tufted honey eater um, sitting on the branch. So slow shutter speed is perfect. So that brings your ISO down. Um, but if the bird's going to move, and I'll just show you a larger version of that, this is a brown gerigony and this is its nest. And these things fly in and out of here very, very quickly. And so when it might be sitting on the edge of the opening here of the nest, you know, it can have a low shutter speed. But then when you sense that it's going to move, then you can um, increase your shutter speed. And just with a flick of the control wheel, you don't necessarily need to know where it's going to go to. It's just going to be higher. And the that distance there was my reaction time from the time that I sensed it was going to move to there. The next frame is out of the frame. So uh, this was very quick and it just sort of captured that, uh, that movement uh, where it drops before it actually starts to fly. And again, I need high enough shutter speed to be able to capture the, the movement. Now, depth of field, um, obviously related to aperture. So it's what you want to have in focus. So if you're wide open, you let more light in and you get a faster shutter speed, but a narrower depth of field. So parts of the bird may be out of focus. Uh, smaller aperture will let less light in. So you get a slower shutter speed, but you get a greater depth of field. Uh, so you get more of the bird in focus. So you want the bird in focus, but it also depends on how close you are to the subject. So the closer you are, the greater the need for a bigger depth of field, so a smaller aperture. And it affects the subject and the background. And the closer the background to the subject, the more it's in focus. And this particular image, the bird is in focus, so it's enough um, aperture for that, but that brings in these closer background into focus, slightly out of focus, but it is there, but the very distant background is out of focus. Um, so I, this is a nice example of the effect of uh, depth of field on what's in focus. Um, I had always had a tendency to shoot with um, my lenses uh, were 5.6 as its lowest um, aperture. And I tended to shoot like that, but I'm now tending to shoot a little bit more 7.1 F8 to um, get a little bit more in focus. Um, so, um, yeah, so even, you know, I, I keep evolving what I'm doing um, all the time, as I guess you guys are as well. Um, Focus, sing, uh, continuous versus single. Obviously, single is great for portraits, but um, continuous is the best for um, birding and uh, because you want to be able to track the moving subject. 
I always have my camera set to continuous, uh, whether I'm doing portraiture or not, uh, because basically, um, as soon as you um, you know lift your finger, you've got the um, subject still in in focus. So the advantage of um, continuous is, and this comes a lot when you are hand holding, and that brown jerigony nest is a good example of it. Is is that um, you can, sorry, um, a little ahead of myself, the back button focus. Um, you want for single or multiple points, a single focal point, um, you can focus on the eye or a stationary object, but a single focal point is also very good when you're trying to weave your way through a lot of the fine branches of some of the shrubbery that things like a whipbird and that can hide in. And um, I can follow a whipbird through all of the fine um, shrubbery um, by using a single focal point and um, be able to actually focus on the bird when it's actually surrounded by some of that shrubbery. Um, so yeah, uh, single focal point is, um, is very, very useful in those circumstances. But if the bird's in flight, uh, a block of focal points makes it easier to lock on to the moving object. Um, and that they're generally set up so that probably one of the block will focus on the bird and preferably you want uh, one um, focal point or autofocus combination that will focus on the nearest. Um, I know I shoot Nikon, some of the um, uh, autofocus groups that you can get will not focus on the nearest necessarily, it will pick or take one of the points and it might suddenly focus on the background. Um, there is one that will focus on the nearest. So um, that is um, something to look for. Back button focus, um, a lot of people do that. I'm assuming you guys are using back button focus, um, but um, in, if not, uh, what it does is that it disconnects the focus from the shutter release. And I think really, um, this happened is a carry on from the film days because you didn't have a lot of buttons on a film camera. So the focus was connected to the, a half press of the shutter. And that made sense with the film camera. But when we got to DSLRs, it, we got more buttons that could be used. And it made sense to shift the focusing away from the shutter release. And this ties in then with continuous uh, autofocus where you can use your back button to focus on the bird, keep that pressed. As the bird moves, you're continually refocusing um, and you disconnect it from the shutter. So the shutter release is only when you go click and uh, that's all the shutter does with back button focus. You can, with some cameras, set it up so that you can still have the half press, but um, uh, it probably is, you know, a lot of people just do separate the two functions. Um, many people have gone that way. Um, I know some of my friends who are not doing that. Um, and it's up to you, you know, what people like to use. But once you've started to use back button, you will wonder why you never used it before. Uh, it does take a little time to adjust to. Generally, in the first week or so, you'll think your camera's broken because you've forgotten that you've changed it to the back button and it's not focusing uh, if you use your shutter as you were used to. But once your muscle memory uh, kicks in, um, yeah, it's really, really good. Focus tracking. I was mentioning that I can follow a whipbird through all the obstacles of fine branches of the shrubbery that things like whipbirds um, go into. I know that Nikon has um, a menu item A3 that adjusts how sensitive um, the, uh, an autofocus will refocus if it, the subject passes behind an obstacle. Um, I don't know about Canon and the other um, brands, um, but it's if your camera does have something like that, have a look at it because the more sensitive you make it, 
the easier it is to refocus when you're trying to follow a bird through through shrubbery and so forth. Um, so frame rates. Um, so a single frame, you know, frame rate is um, frames per second is suitable for stationary objects. But once you get some action taking place, you want to have a fast frame rate. And this is an Eastern Yellow Robin, um, 10 frames a second. These are consecutive frames. And so what she was doing was uh, she started to get agitated, not because I was there photographing her, but because she was starting to regurgitate. And between that image and that image, this appeared. But I missed the one in between um, with it. So um, high frame rates can mean that you can capture something that you wouldn't normally capture. By the way, this nest was uh, within probably a meter and a half of a path in a reserve that's nearby uh, where I'm living. Um, there were lots of people who'd walk by, lots of people on bikes going by, skidding around a corner that was nearby. And the bird was completely oblivious to the whole lot. And most people were completely oblivious to the bird because they never saw it. It was only when it was pointed out to me that I began to see that it was there. So one of the things is that like this, birds that are in a public area are often much more uh, comfortable with people because they get used to people. We found that if you go out into the bush areas, uh, birds will disappear when they're 100 meters away from you because they're not used to humans. But in a more public area, you've got much more opportunity to get shots like this. Um, flash. Um, so low level uh, flash can uh, balance the light on a subject and uh, can be very useful when there's shadows and so forth. But on camera flash can make the subject look a bit flattened. And if it's too bright, the subject will not look natural. So off camera flash is better to use, but then you've got to have a, uh, either somebody who can hold the flash or you've got to have a stand or something and it's not always possible with all the bush and everything but um, that can be useful. One of the um, members in the uh, in another club they use a lot of flash. Um, to my mind they look a little bright, um, they look a little flat uh, but certainly they get some fantastic images and um, they will go out all day and spend hours and hours uh, and days and days and weeks and weeks just to photograph a particular bird at the nest, bringing in food to the, the young one and so forth, get fantastic images. But yes, flash can be very useful. Um, and then approaches to nature shots. And this is perhaps a little more applicable here than over there where you might hire a hide or whatever, but we can go for short outings. Um, as I said, the reserve that's um, only a few hundred meters from me, I can go out and just go for a short walk and you'll find uh, images like this, a, um, uh, a golden whistler having a bath um, in a water pool or on, the, on the track. Um, so you can walk hand, uh, handheld, it's easy have a sling to take the weight of the camera because mine weighs three kilos, gets heavy after a while. You can have day outings uh, where you can go and take, go to a location and wait. I've got friends who uh, go and they'll just go and somewhere and they'll just sit and they'll wait. There may not be a bird there, but a bird will turn up and then they'll get some great shots. So you need obviously a tripod, a gimbal will help. You need a chair, water, you need patience and even more patience and observe flight patterns to get to know where um, birds are likely to, to be. You can either um, walk where you will uh, find um, um, transitory birds feeding or nests or whatever. 
Um, but then you can miss opportunities because you just um, miss deciding you are either not there or you've just passed it. But it's great exercise. And you can, like going out for the day, you can wait in a spot um, and you need patience and to understand the, the habits of the bird. This uh, particular one here is an Eastern Spinebill. Uh, this is actually some flowers on a grave. Um, we went down south to Naruma. Um, there were not a lot of birds around. My friends uh, discovered this spot and we just spent a number of days just photographing uh, the birds that were coming into this uh, flowers. Um, so I've just got some examples um, again. Um, this is walking around Fred Caterson that's near me, a uh, monarch uh, bird, um, an eastern spinebill, a um, white-throated drigony. These make a beautiful sound um, that is like, that's called sort of falling leaves. It's like a um, sound and it's just a beautiful uh, sound and but very, very hard to see and to capture. Um, a yellow-faced uh, honey eater and the whipbird. As you can see, the type of foliage that it likes to, to get into. And uh, I've been lucky enough to be in a, a, a whipbird flurry where for about 15 minutes around me, about eight or more whipbirds were all around me um, chasing each other and just, um, yeah, it was a great opportunity, but very, very hard to capture images. A powerful owl, and this was a young owl, I believe. And this is, looks like a crow to you, but this is what is, uh, is a currawong. It's uh, about the same size as uh, your raven, but the white here and the white in the wings tells me it's currawong. And they were hassling this poor young juvenile powerful owl. And um, so I took some shots, went away from a walk for an hour or so and came back and they were still hassling it. And it had the look of just leave me alone. Again, more whipbirds, and you can, as I said, they do like to get in amongst things. Um, superb fairy wrens. This is the female, uh, a Jenny wren. Um, it has the brown beak and the brown around the eyes. Um, not that colorful compared to the male, which has got a blue um, bonnet on and a black beak. Um, the adolescent male has a blue tail and a black beak and not the brown around here. And as the testosterone kicks in, as they head towards breeding season, that they don't have the blue bonnet when they're juvenile, when they're young um, or not in breeding. And you'll get blue starting to build up over the, um, and they get the bonnet. A uh, tree creeper. This is a variegated fairy wren. So this is the kind of blue that you get on the superb fairy wren, but you've got this orangey red cape and the black around here. Um, these can be called, um, this particular one, um, I go around and I've got an app with their call and they will come. Um, it's not recommended that you do that too often because you know, it disturbs their, um, their pattern, their nature and um, that, but um, you know, they do uh, come. Uh, and again, this is only um, less than a kilometer from where I'm sitting at the moment. Uh, a musk lorikeet, a galah, a crimson rosella, and the powerful owl junior again. Just look at those talons on it. Amazing. The one you saw having a bath was a golden whistler. This is a rufous whistler, uh, so a cousin. This is the golden whistler. 
uh, beautiful sound that it makes. Uh, a little wattle bird, a king parrot. Um, this is an adolescent male. The male has this red and this will build up through here. Uh, you can see it changing color so that this will all go red and have the green leaves. Whereas the female is more, a more drab green all the way through. Uh, Eastern spinebill. A scarlet honey eater. A white cheeked honey eater. Um, the king parrot again. <laughs> Another whip bird. Eastern yellow uh, robin. Uh, these can be quite common. Um, and um, yeah, very uh, cute little bird. More whip birds. A, um, the brown jerigony starting to build their nest. As you can see, um, they bring all these little twigs and weave it together. Um, this was that eastern yellow robin um, at that nest before, and this is the little one in there. As I said, I'm only standing on a path only a short distance away from this nest with lots and lots of people passing by, not even knowing it was there. One of your birds, a blackbird, and I never knew they existed in Australia, but a lot of birds were brought out from uh, Britain um, because the early colonists liked to have their familiar uh, things around them and blackbirds were one of them, um, along with rabbits, foxes that have become pests. Um, foxes can be found in Fred Caterson uh, here. Uh, we also, there's been a kangaroo or two sighted over here as well. So I said, all within walking distance of where I'm sitting. Um, Eastern spinebill, that common bronze wing giving a bit of a better view of that color in the wing. Uh, the white cheeked honey eater again. Um, this is a, not a great image, but this is that adolescent male where you've got the blue tail, black beak, and the colors starting to build. And this will build up right over the head until that's completely blue all around there and looking like that. Not great images, but uh, it gives you the idea of what they, they are. And then I go out to Brewers Lane, um, which is a lagoon that's nearby. And that's where I saw the great crested grebes before. Um, and um, this is a, um, uh, a white-necked uh, heron, an Australian grebe. So this is a little cousin of the great crested grebe and um, starting to get into breeding colors. Ah, when you're out there, there's always other things to uh, photograph. A uh, black-shouldered kite. A reed warbler, um, a bird that you hear and not often see, uh, but when you can and you can get them in full warble, it's nice. Um, very, very hard to then focus on this when you've got all of this stuff in front of it, which is why that setting with single focus enables you to cut through all of this and actually focus on the bird itself. Uh, black shouldered kite um, hovering with its eye on its prey before it um, descends. Um, this is a, a bird that everybody calls a peewee. Um, its name officially is a magpie lark. And maybe you've got something like that in your country, I'm not sure. The reed warbler again. Um, in full voice, full warble, the black swans, and a flurry of Eurasian coots um, taking off. And also, you always take the opportunity to shoot a few things. A chestnut mannequin. And this is an Australian bittern. Um, this is not some a bird that's often seen. 
uh, around. And when I went out, um, I go out to Bushell's Lagoon quite often. And generally I'm there on my own. Occasionally I meet some other people when I'm there. Uh, but I went there this time and there were probably, you know, 15 odd, 20 people there. I actually had to park far away and walk in um, because everybody came to from hundreds of kilometers away in some instances to go and photograph this bird. Um, so whilst it doesn't look, look much, the fact is that this was a pretty rare sighting. Um, again, uh, one of the uh, grebes, uh, reed warblers, uh, a bin chicken coming into land. They don't look very pretty, but a good and interesting bird, usual extra thing. The grebe again, um, a data, um, I think in probably breeding colors with the way that it uh, looks with this crop and and so forth. Uh, this is the yellow spoonbill that uh, I was talking about. Generally, you will see a lot of royals. And if there is a yellow, there'll be an occasional yellow amongst the royals. Uh, one time I went out there and there might have been, it was the complete reverse. They were all yellow billed and just the odd royal with the black beak. Um, black shouldered kite again. Uh, I'm trying to think what these are, but these again are not um, not commonly seen around the place uh, in this particular area, but more common in other waterways. Um, a little dotterel, um, the uh, heron uh, with some like eagle uh, eel or little fish or something, a stilt, which I believe you guys have over there. Uh, So sensitivity of subjects, um, bird's nests. Um, now I believe over your way, you don't put a bird's nest into one of your competitions um, because I, I've even heard you'll get hunted down. Um, we don't quite have that same thing here, but the, one of the things with that the PSA is, uh, and now will soon be in the FIAP is that the welfare of the animal is paramount. But again, basically don't do any gardening, don't disturb the subjects, don't be in groups, to just be mindful of the welfare of the, um, the bird. Um, but um, yes, we, we can shoot birds in nests here, but with sensitivity. And Roy, um, is an exceptional uh, nature judge. And some of the things that he might talk about, I'm not sure what he'll talk about to you, but there are three key elements um, with a competition image, particularly a nature image. It's the technical, the story, and the wow factor. And with nature, the story is more important than the technical. And that is, clearly stated in the nature definition now, because I believe that this came about because you were getting a lot of nature shots, which was a bird on a stick, a bird portrait, and it got a little mundane. So it's now the bird has to be doing something. The bird has something at speak or that's interacting with something. There is a story there and you might have a little bit of a twig in the way. You might have a bit of blurriness, or you might have something that's technically not perfect, but that's fine because the story's more important. Um, so um, that's what we uh, are finding that Roy very much will be mindful of that story. Um, and hopefully he might cover some of that with you. So some stories are the interaction with the egrets, um, the sacred kingfisher coming into the nest with something, um, the osprey uh, eating the fish. 
the little egret, and the little egret has this uh, comb on the, the back. And the story here, and, it's, and this is not a strong story because you need to know it. What it's doing here is dancing and it's stirring up the little fish here so that it would go and um, then um, capture some of the fish. And this I put in as a triptych because I was looking at this eastern yellow robin and um, I could see it intently looking at the sand. And then all of a sudden it dug its beak into the sand, pulled out this worm and then turned around and looked at me to say, see, this is what I was looking for. Um, so yes, you needed the triptych to give the story, but um, there is that story there. Now, um, with uh, post-processing, um, and I've probably got a little bit of time. Basically, I use um, Adobe Camera Raw to adjust um, the, um, so in it, that I just use the, um, uh, using, look at the histogram, I set the black and white points, use texture clarity and dehaze. And that's basically all I do in Adobe Camera Raw. And the same things are available in Lightroom. I don't use Lightroom. I don't like Lightroom. Um, so I come in through a Camera Raw into Photoshop, crop as necessary, uh, although I'm now starting to do that in Camera Raw. Topaz Denoise AI. Um, if you haven't got Denoise AI, I recommend it. It does some amazing things in removing noise. And it also does some sufficient sharpening that I don't use any other sharpening these days. Uh, alternative products are Nick Define to remove noise and then Nick the Vaser and color effects to be able to tweak things if you want. And sharpening um, using the sharpen tool. And um, if you're going to use the sharpen tool, always do that on a blank layer because if you sharpen using a layer that has the image on it, then you are destroying the pixels. Those tools on the left-hand side are pixel destroying tools. If you're going to use them, put a blank layer on, make sure it's going to look at the, the layers below and you can actually uh, sharpen, um, and blur or do anything that you like on a blank layer. If you don't like it, you can use the eraser tool to remove it, or you can just throw that away and do it again. But if you've made a change to your pixels, you can't get them back. And then in printing, you need to sharpen for printing. So I'll just quickly do a demonstration of the, um, of this. Now I just need to work out how I can get my and I'll close that. Close that. Mm. I should have had this preloaded. I think Zoom slows everything down. Okay, so this, this is um, the original of that uh, image. And in my screen, which I should update, um, I said about cropping in Photoshop, which is what I used to do, but um, a fashion photographer from Melbourne came up one time to give us um, a talk about natural light photography, you know, with models and that. And he made the comment about that he crops in camera raw. Um, 
And the reasoning is, is that if you're going and doing all your adjustments on the full frame um, and you're setting your black point and your white point, which might be outside of your crop area, then what's the point? You know, crop first and then do your adjustments. So that's something that I'm starting to do now. Um, and one of the things we need to do would be to straighten the image a little. Um, and I'm just going to quickly just sort of crop in a bit. Perhaps getting it on the thirds a little, um, a little bit of the reflection in the water. And so this now is the uh, image that we, we want. Now, I tend to click on auto to see what it um, does. And it's made some slight adjustments, so it's not too bad. I tend to use a bit of texture. Now, it's to taste. I may go a little too strong um, over time. I guess I will find and adjust that, but that's what I'm currently doing because I'm finding that it's bringing out a lot of the, the detail in the, uh, the feathers here. Um, a little bit of dehaze, which is darkening it a little and is giving a touch of contrast. Um, I then go and start looking at things like with a color temperature, as I said, I shoot sunny. Um, and it's coming out looking white. But just a little tweak and you can make it look a little warmer or a little cooler. So it just depends on how you want your image to look. Um, you don't always have to go with what the camera said. Um, the what it did to balance the color cast that's naturally out there. And that's what we've got to remember. What that's what white balance is doing. Balance is the important word. It is balancing the color temperature that was out there. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, if you hold down the alternate key and the blacks, and then move the slider, then now you'll notice that up here on the histogram, you've got a white line. So we've got the blacks are blowing out and the white here is telling me that they're blowing out. And as we move it across, the blacks disappear, that white triangle has disappeared. So that's basically your blackest black in the image. If you hold down the alternate key, and I'll just go over. So that is the whitest white in the image. And you can bring that back until it disappears. So now you've got the full dynamic range from your black to your white. You can adjust your shadows uh, as needed. And again, you can hold down the alternate key if needs be. Um, but sometimes if it's not having a big effect, then you can just adjust shadows. Now, the shadows are in this area here. And you can see when I put the uh, cursor up here, there's a slight change in the gray of the background in this little area. So these are shadows. These are the blacks. These is what's termed exposure. If you um, change the exposure, you can actually change the, use these to make adjustments and by on the histogram, you can actually slide. And you'll notice that it's the exposure that's sli uh, changing. Highlights, I tend to drop the highlights a little and I can do that from the histogram itself. And you can see that the highlight slider is moving. Okay, um, so you can go either way um, with it, but you adjust it to the point where you feel that it is um, where you want it to be. Uh, so I'll adjust. So you adjust it to where you, you're happy. And then that's all I do. Sometimes if the colors aren't right, I might go down into the color mixer and do a little tweaking of colors, but um, uh, no, right.
And like all things, the first thing you do is do a control J to get a new um, layer. If I go into the filter, Topaz Denoise, Now I tend to um, use the same settings and I don't uh, use the auto or anything like that. Um, I tend to find that it works out fairly well. I set the remove noise to about 55, the sharpness to about 35 and recover original detail to about 15 do an update, as you can see that there is noise there and it will go and create a preview and then we'll use the slider to show you the before and after. Okay, so on the left is the noise, on the right is the image without the noise. Now, to my eye, the feathers and the detail in the bird is still there. The claws, and in fact, to me, the area around the talons here actually looks sharper than um, before. So not only does it remove the noise, but it does sufficient sharpening that I'm not really doing much other sharpening these days. So that's Topaz Denoise. If you're not using it, I can certainly recommend it. And then you just do apply and it will now go and actually apply that. Another, <clears throat> another product that um, Topaz has is a sharpen tool and it um, has three different modes. One's just straight sharpening. The other is stabilized. So when you've got that little bit of motion blur in there, um, sharp, uh, the stabilized can affect that. And the other one is focus. So when you may be slightly out of focus, it can do some adjusting with that. It's not something that I do all that often, um, but it is a tool that is very useful to, um, to look at. Peter, the, the, adv the advice yep. for denoise is to yep. actually do it on your full frame before you crop because it gives it more of the image to do its calculations on. Okay. I'll have to um, have a look at that then. No, I appreciate that, uh, that feedback. Uh, I, um, I, I used to uh, crop in Lightroom and then import into Photoshop and use denoise there, but I've started doing it, uh, doing the denoise in Lightroom before I crop and it does make a difference. Okay, I'll, I'll look at that, thank you. Um, the next thing that I tend to do is just a very slight curves, um, just a little bit of the shadows, a little bit on the highlights. And the difference can be, and it's only subtle, but it can just remove that little bit of flatness or that little bit of um, sort of haze that you can sometimes get in images. And maybe we get a lot more of that out here um, with the kind of atmosphere that we can have. Um, sometimes it only makes a subtle difference, but sometimes it just makes an image pop just with those little subtle changes. Um, and that's basically what I do as much as I do these days. And with the mirrorless camera these days, when you're getting a, um, the image, you're the exposure more correct because you can see it in the viewfinder. Um, I'm, not, I'm doing a lot less post-processing now than what I, I used to. Now, the last thing, uh, and I don't do that, didn't need to do, believe I would need to do it on this image, is um, sharpening. As I said, if you have a blank layer, you pick your sharpen tool, uh, sam uh, sample all layers, and just have your 
um, brush tool, a little smaller than the eye, and just go around. Oh, I'll just zoom out a little. Is what you do. And what will happen on here is you'll actually get pixels being altered on this layer here, not on a layer like this, where you're actually destroying the pixels. And if you don't like what you're doing, you just get the eraser tool and just go back and erase it or throw the layer away and start again. Um, much, much easier. Why is, what's the difference with here is, is that if you go up several more layers above and then you realize, oh, you've over sharpened here, then you've, if you've got added to the pixel layers up here, then you can't go back and change it. But with this layer, you could throw it out, start again, and um, you'll be fine. It, it's um, a lot of tools over here, um, are very best done on a blank layer to use them. Okay. So that's basically my uh, presentation. And um, I think I've pretty much got to the two hour mark. Um, so, um, so uh, yeah, I'll go okay. back to you guys. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, most interesting, and I, I wasn't expecting uh, any education. Thank you very much. No, it was uh, really, and really interesting and really valuable. I enjoyed the, the editing part in particular, as well as seeing all your fantastic photos. You certainly have some fabulous birds over there. <laughs> yes, uh, certainly so a little different, perhaps. Yeah, they're brilliant. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yes. And a lot of the birds, like um, soft-crested cockatoos, um, galahs, um, corellas, and that these are just birds that are around us all the time, even, yeah. you know, in our urban areas and so forth. Yeah. Um, a lot of people would see them as exotic, I guess, but to us, this is normal. Yeah. And uh, that, and, and a lot of birds, uh, from, as you saw from that map that I showed you, um, two hours drive in any direction and I've got a, a wealth of birds to photograph. Yeah, brilliant. And you can get out and see them at the moment, which we can. Yes, yes, we can. And, um, and I, I am aware that you guys are locked down and we've got yeah. the ability to get out and about. Um, we've had the situation where we have been affected to some degree where um, our competition um, no.